All right, so today we, we're going to move on to uh, chapter 13 in Mark. And um, this is known as the Olivet Discourse. It's, it's a, an answer that Jesus gives to his disciples about what the end times were going to look like. And it's the longest answer to any question um, in the, uh, in the, it's recorded in the Bible that he gave to anybody. So it's a little bit of a lengthy passage, but I thought what we do is read the whole, the whole passage because it all goes together, and then uh, just consider the first uh, about 13 verses today. So um, if you would turn with me to Mark chapter 13, uh, beginning in verse 1, and we'll, we'll read to the end of the chapter. And then we'll pray, and then we'll consider it. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will, be, that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. Be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house, nor take anything out. And let the one who's in the field not turn back, take his clothes. And last, for women who are pregnant and for those that are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and will never be. And if the Lord had not cut short those days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Be on guard. I have told you these things beforehand. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from the heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. And from the fig tree learn its, and from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and put out leaves, you know summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. And truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands a doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. 
lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. All right, let's pray. Father, again, as we consider this passage, Lord, I, we thank you for really the clarity of it to, to show us and to make us aware of what these latter days will be like. So, Lord, as we go over this, may we just uh, uh, understand that, what to look for, be discerning, be perceptive of what's going on around us, and understand that this is all part of your sovereign plan before you return. Uh, so be with me now as I speak. May it be clear and uh, not misrepresent anything here, uh, but be edifying to all of us. In your son's name, amen. So the world's not getting any better, right? I mean, that's pretty clear from this passage, and it's not going to get better before the end comes. And for since the beginning, you know, of creation, there's been, there's been wars, there's been disease, there's been destruction, there's conflicts with, between nation and nation, within families, um, earthquakes, famines, all those things have marked uh, these last times, certainly in our lifetime and certainly since the beginning as well. And this is how it's going to be when he returns, or until he returns. You know, it's not going to get any better. Uh, it's a dangerous place to live. Um, not a rose garden. It's not going to be um, something that is going to just kind of ease on into peace and tranquility. You know, there, uh, there are a lot of people that thought about the 1900s that uh, because of technology and the Industrial Revolution that the world was going to, get better and better because now we could supply the needs of everybody and everyone be at peace. Nobody's going to be fighting. There's not going to be any wars. Well, obviously that hasn't happened. World War I came along, then World War II, then all the subsequent wars around. Um, and there's those that believe that the gospel is going to bring peace to the world. Um, that's not God's plan. I think you can see very clearly what he tells his disciples here that it's not going to be a gradual things getting better, but a things getting worse, and it's going to exponentially increase as the end draws near. Now, the, the Jewish people thought the Messiah was there to bring peace, and he was going to bring peace because he was going to be a conquering um, you know, leader of Israel. Israel was going to conquer its foes and then would... would kind of usher in the peace, and they would be in charge. They would be the kingdom in charge. And that was, that was their, their idea of the Messiah. And, and, and when Jesus came into, the, um, into Jerusalem in that final week, you know, they're all hailing him as the Messiah. But again, that's what they thought he was going to be, an earthly uh, leader that would usher this new era into peace um, by his being an earthly commander. And the disciples knew he was the Messiah as well, they had a little bit different view. Their eyes had been opened somewhat to, to because they had been with Jesus, seen the miracles he'd done, everything he'd done. They knew that he was not just an earthly man, but that he was a son of God. But they still thought the kingdom that he was going to bring was going to happen right then. It was going to happen immediately. Um, matter of fact, in Luke 19, 11, uh, Jesus had to tell this parable. Uh, he said he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So they had this idea, this time frame, that the kingdom would be there soon, immediately. And even though Jesus had told them, hey, listen, I'm going to be killed, uh, I'm going to rise on the third day, they still thought that even with that, that the kingdom was going to come immediately. Because even after Jesus had resurrected, had taught him for 40 days, and was about to be ascended, they still ask the question, uh, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So they failed to see not only just the time frame, but they really failed to see Jesus' purpose for coming the first time. His purpose for coming the first time was to die for our sins, was to make the atonement for our sins, and they missed that. Their question was always when. When is this going to happen? And they felt it was going to be uh, soon. So the context now of... Uh, where we come today in Mark chapter 13, verse 1, is Wednesday of the Passion Week. Okay, all the, the last several weeks, all of chapter 12, 11 and 12 really were his last week in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, Passion Week. This is Wednesday, and this will be kind of at the end of the day now. 
He had spent all day Wednesday teaching in the temple, and as you know, the, on Tuesday he'd come in and he turned over the tables, he cleansed the tables, he told them it was a den of thieves. He, on Wednesday he had all the interchanges with those that were trying to trap him, and then at the end he, he uh, condemned or pronounced judgment on the scribes. He said, you've got to beware of them, and said all the things that described them perfectly. So basically what he had done is he had condemned the religious leaders, he had condemned the temple where they worshipped, he had really kind of condemned what Judaism had become. Um, but for that one day in the temple, he taught the truth and that, uh, on Wednesday as well. So let's kind of move on now, Mark. And listen, in verse 1 of chapter 13, uh, as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. So they, he's walking out of the temple now. Uh, he's about ready to head east. We'll see that in a minute. But the temple itself, uh, and we've told this, is really one of the most magnificent structures of the ancient world. It was, um, as you recall, it's the second temple that was built. The initial one was built by Solomon. Uh, it was destroyed uh, as part of the judgment on Israel, and they were taken into captivity. The second temple was built when they, the exiles returned. Um, and it's described there in Ezra and Zerubbabel were the ones in charge of that. But Herod had really greatly expanded it during this time. And so he began, there was a great expansion, it began about 19 BC, which would have been 30, 40 years, 50 years before this, yeah, before that. And it actually ended in 63 AD. So for 80 years, Herod was building on this temple, not so much as a testament to the God because he was a pagan but as a testament to him and his wealth and and what he could do but the temple nonetheless was the center of Jewish life for thousands of years before this okay ever since they returned from the exile and Josephus tells us it was a magnificent structure that stretched 500 yards long and 400 yards wide five football fields that way four this way that's a pretty big building and then that did not include even the grounds that were around it. Um, the building itself was gold-plated on the outside, and where it wasn't gold, it said there was white marble that was so, it was so white that if you sat and looked at it from a distance, it looked like there was snow on it. Um, and the stones they were made of were massive. 70, one stone would be 70 feet by 9 by 7 half feet, which if you picture that as one solid rock, it's, it's really a testament to their engineering, how they did that in the first place, uh, but uh, massive as well. And the pillars, Josephus says, were 27 feet in diameter. So that's a pretty big pillar in diameter, and there's 162 of them. So it just kind of gives testament to how massive this temple was, how big it was, and it was so massive that, it, that they would swear by the temple. It kind of became an idol to them. But the temple was, was, was one massive structure. And that's why his disciples would say that. And then Jesus, in, in verse 2, says to them, Do you see these great buildings? There will, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. He's saying it's this magnificent structure, this thing that's been the center of Jewish religion for a thousand years, it's going to be completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. And that happened 40 years later, 70 A.D., uh, the Jews revolted against Rome. They had done kind of multiple times in the past, had some early successes, but the Romans eventually uh, thwarted it, and not only thwarted it, but crushed them severely. Um, the last remaining Jews that were inside, this is told again by Josephus, that, that were inside Jerusalem once they were sieged from the outside, retreated to the temple, because uh, that was the strongest, the most secure place. Um, and they set it afire, and so they burned in there. And, and in the process, all the gold would melt in and among the stones. And, and finally, when there were no more people for, for the Romans to kill or plunder, uh, Caesar ordered that the temple and the whole city be completely destroyed. Some say they destroyed the temple so, uh, so significantly or so completely because they wanted the gold that had been melted and kind of gone down in between the rocks and so in order they had to destroy everything. Um, so the purpose of that is historically then what Jesus predicted, and I don't like that word predict, prophesized, it's going to happen. Okay, prediction I think of as someone 
predicting it's going to happen. Like, when's the earth going to die? And, you know, and they take all these things. Now, Jesus prophesied that this would happen, and in fact, it did. Uh, it, proven by history as well. And so, so this tells us that, and we should know this as well, that, that the prophecies of Jesus, the predictions of Jesus, whatever Jesus says will happen is reality. It will happen. So it's not a wishful thinking or hope that it might happen. It is happening. So any prediction that we see in this, and this kind of sets the tone for the remaining discourse here. The destruction of the temple completely happened. You go, and it happened literally happened. Everything that's going to happen from here on out will happen literally because Jesus said that. So the idea is we got to remember any prophecy he has is, is reality. It will come to pass. And, and so many that he has given before. He predicted his death and his resurrection beforehand. He, you know, he told Satan he was going. I mean, he told Peter that Satan was going to sift him, and he was going to deny him three times, and he he did. And he even told Paul on the Damascus Road, you know, you're going to be my instrument to the Gentiles. And sure enough, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. So everything he says will literally come to pass. Now, verse 3 and 4, then the disciple says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, he said, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? So now Jesus leaves the temple. He's headed east. He goes through the Kidron Valley and up the Mount of Olives, which is called the Mount of Olives because there were many olive trees at that time that grew on it. Um, and then if he kept going east, he would go to Bethany where he, he spent the night at, at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Uh, and so it's kind of east of this. So they'd be looking back to Jerusalem at the temple. Um, and it'd be a magnificent view because they're actually elevated above it somewhat. But looking at this whole, the west wall of the temple, which would be gold, would be really pretty magnificent to see. And even though this was at the end of the day, and the, no, they were looking at the east wall. Excuse me. I got to get that right. Uh, even though the sun would be on the other side, it would still be a magnificent thing to look at. And so you're kind of thinking, what, what are the, why are these disciples, you know, uh, uh, Peter and James and John and Andrew, they're, they're, that's kind of his inner circle. What, what, are, what are they thinking right now? Why are they asked this question? Um, I think it would not be um, unusual that they would be thinking, because Jesus had just said the temple was going to be destroyed, they're thinking, well... You know, that happened once before, and it happened because of God's judgment and his apostasy as well. And so it wouldn't be uh, too outside the thing to, to speculate that maybe they were thinking that. And seeing the events of the week that just took place up to that, where Jesus was condemning the temple and condemning uh, the leaders uh, as well, that may be something that they were thinking. So, so they, have to, they question, how are we gonna, when's this going to happen? That's always, when's it going to happen? And how are we going to know? What are the beginning of signs? Matthew tells us in his parallel passage that they said, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So there's actually a couple of questions in there as well. And, and just to summarize Jesus' answer <laughs> um, that we'll talk about, that he said, world's a dangerous place. All these wars, everything's been going on. It's going to get worse before I come back. Um, he gives us warning. He gives us things to look for. Uh, he gives us eyes to perceive what's going on. Um, and he says to be alert and don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. I've told you these things beforehand, what it's going to be like. So therefore, take hope and you will endure. That's kind of the gist of what he, he says in the next few verses. Then in verse 5, uh, or then he really gives them three warnings and three um promises over the next few verses. So the first warning he gives is in 5 to 6. He says, And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And if you look down to verses 22 and 23, he adds this. He says, For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all these things beforehand. So the first warning he gives is of false teachers, false Christ, people who 
either proclaim to be Christ or come in the name of Christ as a representative of Christ, but being a false teacher and, and giving a false gospel and false teachings. And the word there that, uh, that is translated in verse 5c is called is blepo. It's the same word that actually I mentioned last week is translated beware um, when Jesus is giving his warnings about the scribes. Beware of the scribes. And literally, again, it means to have the faculty of sight. But it means to perceive or to discern mentally. It's more than just uh, the uh, faculty of sight. Because you can have sight. You know, sight re actually requires a literal sight. It requires an eyeball, but it also requires your mind. Okay? I mean, it's got to send the signals to your mind so you can kind of see, right? Okay. And in the same way, you know, you can have a perfectly good eyeball, uh, but if the mind doesn't sense it, you're blinded. And, and that's exactly what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that the God of this world does. Um, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says he's blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel in Jesus Christ. So that's what he is saying there. He's saying, don't be blinded. See, perceive. This is what's going to happen. Um, and all these false teachers, you know, they've been present since the beginning. They've been there for a long time. But he's saying it's going to increase as the time draws near. Uh, Paul warns us in Acts 20, uh, as he said goodbye to the uh, Ephesian elders there, he said to them, pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Again, another warning by Paul. Paul warns Timothy in 2 Timothy that evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse and more frequent. Um, in 2 Peter, uh, Peter warns the uh, elect exiles that, uh, about false prophets as well. He says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, and who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who, brought them, who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. Their condemnation was from the beginning of time. They're, they're agents of Satan, the false teachers that, that, that are described here. They're, uh, they're disguised as angel of light. They're disguised as those that, that, uh, that represent Jesus, but they're not. And their condemnation is from long ago. They, they will be condemned. And in 1 John, John just reminds, them, reminds us, don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits, see if they're from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we must test things. We must perceive what's going on. And all these false teachers that, that have happened from the beginning of time till now, they all kind of foreshadow the ultimate false teacher or the ultimate false prophet, which would be the Antichrist. Uh, and that's described in, in Daniel, uh, chapters 8 and 36. He described there as the king, the king of the world. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians, he's described as the man of lawlessness and the son of destruction, that he must come before the end. And in Revelations, he's described as the beast, the beast, the Antichrist. And so although he will, receive, he will deceive many, this Antichrist and all the false teachers uh, up until him, he can't deceive the elect. He can't deceive those that are his. And Jesus told his disciples that plainly in John chapter 10. And I think I have it in your outline there for it. It says, uh, to him, to the, the true shepherd, he's speaking of himself as, as the true shepherd, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, the sheep follow him, they know his voice. In verse 5, a stranger they will not follow. You will not follow. You, if you are 
If you are a believer today and you're, you're part of God's elect, God will give you the eyes to perceive those false teachers and you will not follow them. But many will be perceived. Many will be perceived. So he gives a warning here first of false teachers, false Christ, uh, false um, uh, prophets. All those will kind of become more and more uh, frequent. Um, if you don't believe me, just watch Christian TV and kind of discern for yourself how many of those are, are true and not. Um, and, uh, and, after, and then he gives a warning of the er earthly devastation, what's going to happen on the earth. This is what's going to mark the beginning of the last times as well. In verses 7 and 8, he says, And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. Say, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. But these are the beginning, or but the beginning of birth pain. And so these wars, these conflicts, these natural disasters, they're all, uh, they're going to continue like birth pains, and that's just like the appropriate analogy for that. For any of you who've had given birth, you know what that's like. It starts off kind of, starts off kind of bad, okay, not too bad, and it's not very frequent, then it kind of gets worse, worse, and more frequent, more frequent, okay, until the end. And then at the end there's delivery, Right? And that's kind of a perfect analogy. At the end, we'll be delivered. The Son of Man will come back and will deliver us from, from this earthly world. But it's a great analogy that we have in our mind. And, 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 and when he gives us that, as we experience that or see that, we, we won't be alarmed. Because that's his next thing he says there. Do not be alarmed. Do not be frightened. Because in troubled times, many think people will see, um, will see these ca catastrophes and these wars and these diseases and everything. And they'll think the end is here. And they'll, you know, freak out. It's, it's kind of almost a testing of your faith. But we're not supposed to be frightened. We're not supposed to be alarmed. This is what's going to happen. And he says, this must take place there in verse 7. Um, and why does it ta must take place? And I like that word. I like that, that verse, that this must take place. And so from a human standpoint, we can think of all sorts of reasons why this must take place. One of them might be, well, we just live in a fallen world. All these things are part of sin and everything, and there's some truth to that, certainly. But uh, we can think, well, it's, it's part of separating the wheat and the tares, okay, part of our testing. And I think all those have, you know, some truth to them as well. But in reality, it must take place because that's a sovereign degree, decree of God, that he has decreed that this is what the end will take place. He's, he told us that the end will not be this gradual, uh, just everything getting better and better until we have peace and Jesus returns. It's going to be, it's going to be different than that. And the reason being is is the gospel. The gospel is um, it divides. The gospel to those that are perishing is foolishness. Um, it's a stumbling block. It's an affront. It's it's an offense to people that are perishing. And so what it does, it divides. The wicked from the righteous. It divides believers from unbelievers. It divides those who are children of God from those who will be children of Satan. And it divides the kingdom of darkness from the kingdom of light. So the gospel is not one that is going to, the, uh, going to obtain world peace through the gospel on this earthly time. Okay, and then, But the end is not yet. And so these, all these things foreshadow, really, all these wars and things foreshadow, really, that final conflict that will take place um, in Revelation 16 and 19 at Armageddon. And so, so there's been wars throughout history. There's been, you know, and millions of people died during wars. Uh, just an example of a few. A war in China in 755, 36 million died. In the Mongol conquest in the 13th century, 30 million. World War I, 20 million. World War II, 72 million. Uh, but those death rates really dwarf in comparison for the final uh, conflict that takes place at Armageddon. So not only will there be wars, but there will be all these natural disasters. There will be earthquakes. Luke says, uh, Luke says great earthquakes, uh, seismoi, megaloi. And, and uh, scientists tell us that, that every year, there's 500,000 earthquakes that register on the seismic, seismic scale. So we really are on shaky ground here. Um, but none will cause as much, and, and out of those 500,000, only 100,000 are, are felt, but, but
But none of these earthquakes will cause as much devastation as the ones in Revelation when he returns. And just for an example, in Revelation 6, 12, this is what's going to happen. It says, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as the, flick, as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. So this earthquake will drastically alter the geographic look of the earth. Okay. It's going to be a great, great earthquake. And then Luke adds that one of the signs will be plagues, plagues that will uh, plague humanity until he returns as well. A few of those we've already experienced. Uh, we haven't, but back in the 1300s, the Black Plague, which killed 75 to 200 million people. That's a pretty 60% of the population of Europe. Uh, the influenza, one in the early 1900s, killed 40 million. Um, we don't know what COVID is. I guess I'm sure there's a, a number on that as well, too. And, and, and other viruses that are coming down the chute, right? I mean, that's what they keep predicting. Um, there'll be famines. Throughout history, there's been famines. You know, there's the one that Paul was, was getting the offering for in First and Second Corinthians. Uh, there was a great famine in Europe about 30 years before the Black Plague. There was a famine that killed... 60% of the population before then, too. So Europe was hit pretty hard, I would say. But the world's a dangerous place, okay? And it's going to continue. And these are only the beginning of the birth planes. But do not be frightened. This is God's plan for the end times, we understand. The next warning he gives is persecution. Persecution has been going on. It is going to continue. It's going to increase. Um, in verse 9 through 12, again, it says, Be on your guard. They're going to deliver you over to councils. You'll be beaten in the synagogues. You'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And they will bring you trial and deliver you over. Don't be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death and the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. So he tells us again, be, be on your guard. And these are some of the same instructions he gave to the disciples when he sent them out uh, back in Matthew chapter 10 on their kind of short-term mission trip. He gave them the, uh, the um, ability to drive out demons and to heal and things like that. But he, he told them this is what's going to happen. But the next night after he gave these instructions here uh, in Mark, <clears throat> In John chapter 16, he, he, gave him, he told them again that this is what's going to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, they will put you out of the synagogues. <clears throat> he says, indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. So they will kill you thinking that they are doing God a favor. So this persecution came not only from the Jews, which was kind of the immediate uh, persecutors of, uh, of the disciples after that, and it says that they will, and the courts, you know, they said they will beat you in the synagogues, you know, that's where the courts were, were in the synagogue, and, uh, you know, if the, they'd have judges that would um, judge the offense and declare how the punishment should be, and as you know, Old Testament <clears throat> said you can't give them more than 40 lashes, and so, you know, we know that Paul got 40 minus 1 five times, uh, he tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 24. So he was obviously persecuted by the Jews. Uh, the book of Acts certainly records many, many instances where believers face persecution at the hands of the Jews. But it also comes from the Gentiles. It says you'll stand before governors and kings. Uh, we know Paul stood before, was imprisoned multiple times by the Romans. But here's the purpose for these persecutions. He says you'll stand before kings, um, for my sake, to bear witness before them. So the purpose of these persecutions is to bear witness of Jesus Christ to those that are persecuting you. You're doing it for his sake. Um, that is uh, something to always keep in mind, and when you think of all the martyrs that have gone before, they certainly understood that. Um, and the persecution may even come from your own family, as it's stated, and perhaps that's probably one of the most difficult to stand up against because um, it's your family. You know, 
In church, it's pretty easy to declare Christ as Lord because most everybody else thinks that too, right? But what if you're from a, an Orthodox Jewish family and you became a Christian? You know, you're going to be you're going to be rejected. You're going to be called a blasphemer, uh, according to theirs. Or what if you're Hindu? You know, you're going to be rejected from their faith. Muslims, you'll not only be rejected, you'll probably be martyred uh, if you became uh, one of them. So your own family will be part of this persecution. And so what we must understand also, not only to expect it, and he said that also in Matthew 10, verses 34 and 38, he said this, Jesus said this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. So whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not Take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So we must love Jesus more than those even in our immediate family that we have, or you're not worthy of being his disciple. So that means in the time of persecution, when they say something to you, okay, you will not deny your maker. You will stand firm and be given the words to say. Um, and that's the next thing, he promised, the three promises. He promises grace. So long ago, Along with these persecutions, there's this promise of grace that will be supplied to you um, it, for the suffering that you're experiencing, for the persecution that you're experiencing. Uh, in, in verse 11 there, Mark, it says, And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So in times of troubling, the Lord will provide the grace needed for that troubling. Just like he, in times of temptation, will provide a method of escape. Just like, uh, like Paul's thorn, the suffering that caused him, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. It's his grace that will get you through the suffering. And true believers, when faced with this persecution, um, will not deny the Lord. They will not deny the Lord, but they'll respond with words given to them by the Spirit at that time but they will not deny the Lord. Um, and nothing was, uh, this was evident very, very quickly after that. In Acts 4, when, when they arrested uh, Peter and John, the council arrested Peter and John. It says in Acts 4, 1, that Peter and John, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke boldly in the name of Jesus to their, his accusers, the, the council as well. And in verse 13, it says, Now when they, the council, saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceive they are uneducated common men, it says they were astonished. Luke tells us that uh, in the parallel passage that I will give you a mouth of wisdom, a mouth, I will give you a mouth and wisdom, none of which your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Now that doesn't mean that, that he'll give you the words to say and then they're going to release you. Okay? God will give you the words to say, and that may be the words that they use to persecute you and to kill you. So it's not that he's given you the words to say to save your earthly life, but he's given you the words to say because he's already saved your eternal life. Um, and it's evidence of that. And, that. and Fox's Book of Martyrs is testimonies of many, many Christians that would not deny it in the face of death. And then he promises propagation of the gospel. That's the second promise there chapter, in verse 10. And the gospel must be first proclaimed to all nations. So in spite of all these persecutions, and calamities, the gospel will spread throughout the world. It can't be stopped. It can't be stopped. And the end can't come until the gospel has been preached throughout the whole world. Matthew 24, 14, a parallel passage says, um, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So these 12 men starting off in this little bitty thing in Judea uh, were told to, send the gospel to Samaria and the ends of the earth, um, still is going to the ends of the earth. We think that maybe, you know, in this day of technology that everyone would have heard it, but uh, I know there's still people groups out there that the gospel has not been preached. So what, is, uh, what it really boils down to here is then his, his third promise here, the promised hope that, he, that we have 
during these end times, during these troubled times. In verse 13, uh, he says, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. You know, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Um, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Luke says, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. So what does he mean by that? What, save, gain lives. Um, it, it means your eternal salvation. You know, in, in Mark and Matthew, uh, for this word saved, is the word sozo, which many times in the New Testament is used. Uh, it actually means to be saved or rescued, but it's about salvation, eternal salvation. But Luke uses, you will gain your lives. Your lives is the word psyche, which we... That's even an English word as well today, but it, it literally means your immortal soul. It's what you are on the inside. So do we then just kind of, what's he saying here? Do we just kind of grit our teeth and endure? Do we just kind of, you know, do that on our own strength? Just, you know, and we know that's not the case. We know that's not the case. Because you don't earn your salvation by anything you do. You, don't, you do not earn your salvation by enduring these trials and these persecutions. You endure these trials and persecutions because you've got the real thing, because you've got the real faith in God, because you've got true saving faith. You have that faith that's given to you by God. That's how you endure these things. So it's an, it's an indication of who you are uh, during these trials and persecutions. Superficial faith, on the other hand, is also taught about in the Bible. It'll collapse when persecution comes along. Uh, the parable of the, of the soils is the, the example that Jesus gives. Uh, as you recall, that he threw the seed out on the rocky ground, and that never really took root. But he threw it out, I mean, he threw it out on the path, that never took root. The rocky ground, it took root, okay, or it began to grow, uh, but then it fizzled out when the heat came around. And so Jesus explains that in Mark uh, 4.17. He says, those that are the, the rocky soil, said they have no root in themselves. They endure for a while, but then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, on account of Jesus, uh, immediately they fall away. Those are uh, whom the seed fell on the rocky soil. And in 1 John, it's just to prove that they went out from us um, because they were not of us, okay? If they'd been of us, they would have they continued with us. But they went out that it might be complained they were not of us. So Jesus' prophecies here is, again, just to back up, this is uh, the prophecy of beginning of end times, and we'll probably have a couple more weeks that we'll talk about it. But Jesus' prophecies are realities. Just like he predicted the destruction of the temple that happened, everything that he predicts will happen. It is real. It's reality. So all these disasters, these wars, these trials, these persecutions, the gospel being preached to the whole world, uh, the faith that you have to endure to the end, these are all, Jesus, these are all realities. Uh, they've been manifested um, in the past. They will be manifested in the future, and they will continue to be manifested until he returns. So the world's not an easy place. It's dangerous. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you uh, that you have given us your word, your word that strengthens us, that emboldens us, that gives us the wisdom, that gives us the foresight that we can perceive these things that happen uh, before they actually take place on this earth. But you have told us this beforehand, uh, so we will not be frightened. Lord, just give us that strength in the time of uh, persecution, the time of uh, doubt, we ask for your strength through the Holy Spirit and the words to proclaim you. In your son's name, amen.